I want to welcome you this Sunday to Garden City Church Online. I'm Pastor Aaron. I'm grateful that you're here with us. I want to take a quick minute, and I want to first of all thank those of you who continue to faithfully present your tithes and offerings to the Lord every single week. I want to give a shout out to our virtual audience, our virtual church family. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for being with us. I pray that every week that you're with us, you are absolutely blessed, enriched, and encouraged. Your tithes and offerings can be presented online through our website at GardenCityChurch.net. Remember, we continue to produce ministry and we're continuing to support our missionaries around the world. I also want to invite you on Sunday, November 22nd at 6.30 p.m. If you're in our vicinity, we'd love for you to join us in person for a special evening worship service. There'll be a time of fellowship prior to the service. Uh, We will continue to maintain social distancing. We are asking you to please wear your mask, but come ready to worship the Lord. We're going to have a special music presentation. I'm really excited. I'm actually going to be leading a time of worship. So uh, I invite you to join us November 22nd. Let's get into today's message. It's entitled, Opposition to Your Vision. Opposition to Your Vision. I want to talk to you about vision and the opposition you will face when you begin to exercise the steps to obtain your destiny. Now remember, I don't want to sound mystical. Destiny, your destination is what that simply means. God has a specific destination in mind for you. So before we get into today's Bible passage, I want to do a quick recap of what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about Nehemiah's vision and how it was rooted and birthed from a place of mercy. The inception of Nehemiah's vision really became came from a place of mercy. Uh, the couple of things that I encourage you to t- take away, and you could go back and read Nehemiah chapter 1. Number one, when people came to visit Nehemiah, he had some brothers. He associated himself with the people, with the Hebrews, his fellow people from Jerusalem. He associated himself with their despair, their, 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 their difficulty, their hurt, their lack. He associated himself with those people. And too often we we lock ourselves up in our ivory towers and unless we're hurting, we don't seem to feel pain. But God wants you to feel the pain and feel the the hurt and sometimes wear the compassion necessary to associate yourself with hurting people. The second thing is it said he had compassion on their condition. He had true compassion. So not only did he associate himself with it, according to Nehemiah's 1-2, when he recognized his fellow Hebrews as brothers, but he associated himself with that pain. The Bible tells us that he he went into a time of weeping as he heard about what they were going through. And then thirdly, the weeping and the association led him to a place of action. I don't know about you, but there's been times when I've encountered it that people are going through very difficult things. And I have to ask myself, what can I possibly do? I think Nehemiah asked the same thing. What did he do? He fasted and he prayed. What an encouragement when you face a challenge that's beyond you and you don't feel like you have the solution. I want you to know the answer is fast and pray. Seek God and God will have an answer for you. So from that, the division was deposited in his heart. What was his vision? Well, he had a vision to go and repair, rebuild, and reinforce the walls of Jerusalem. The walls were broken down. They were burned. The the city gates were burned. Uh, And and he wanted to go back and he wanted to repair that the glory might be uh, restored, that the city would be recognized as a city of God. He wanted to rebuild. He wanted to empower the people. So it wasn't just a work to rebuild the walls, but it, it was a work to rebuild the people as well. Encourage them to defend and serve God through active participation of the mission. And then thirdly, reinforce. The reinforcement wasn't just in the walls, reinforcement was in leaving the legacy of spirituality by opening up and dedicating the word of God to the people as the life-giving core. Spiritual renewal is the reinforcement for the people. So what's next now? Glad you asked. We're gonna read out of Nehemiah 2, 16 through 20. Follow along with the reading. It says, and the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the bad situation that we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire? Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. 
And I told them how the hand of God had been favorable to me, and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, Let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard, they mocked us and despised us and said, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. So Nehemiah, after standing before the king, he presents a request to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city walls. This was risky. In chapter 1, as he presents himself to the king, the king recognizes that his face is downcast. That this carries a lot of weight because to be in the king's presence and to have a countenance anything less that would honor the king could mean your death. So, understandably, Nehemiah was afraid to be in the presence of the king and not have his P's and Q's together. But the word of God tells us that God granted him great courage. I want to tell you today, be of great courage. Be of great courage despite the fact that it might look like our proverbial walls, our proverbial city, our proverbial dreams, our proverbial nation looks like it's being burnt to the ground right now. It looks like rivalry. It looks like division. Let God grant you courage today. The second thing is that Nehemiah is given great favor in the king's uh, presence as well as the king's resources. So after he presents this petition to the king that he would like to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls, the king grants him his, his petition and grants him great access. It includes timber from the king's forest, letters to the governors, soldiers, horses, chariots. Don't you know God will always find a way to finance his vision? Hallelujah. You've got a dream, you've got a goal right now, and you feel like you're trapped in a place of service that's not fulfilling the mission, the call, the purpose for your life. Have courage. Not only will God grant you favor in the right time should you seek his face, pray fast, but he'll also grant you the resources that are necessary to accomplish a great undertaking. Now, when he arrived to Jerusalem, the first thing Nehemiah does is he assesses the condition of the gates. When I was reading this, it blew my mind that so far up to this point, this great endeavor has taken place uh, as hearsay. It's only been hearsay. He hasn't been there to actually see what's going on, but when he arrives, he goes and he expects. And this reminds me that he had a revelation without confirmation. He had revelation without confirmation. You know, that's an act of faith. Some of you have a revelation of something very deep, but you don't have the, the ingredients for the full confirmation, but you're going on a deep internal revelation that there's a dream in your heart that ought to take place, that God has called you to act something out, to do something, to accomplish something. You've got a revelation of a dream, but you don't know how you're going to get there. You don't know how you're going to make it happen. I want you to know that God, when he puts a dream in you, he will finance it. He will grant you the favor. He will make it happen. If you have the revelation, he will grant you the confirmation at the right time. So he went without confirmation. And that, that, that this would have been a problem, uh, but now it's been verified as he walks around and he, thirdly, he goes to inspect the gates. Now, sometimes you're going to take a walk on your own. Now, notice when he arrives, he quietly slips out and he goes and he personally checks it and nobody knows where he went. He didn't share the mission. He didn't share the deep down dream and desire that he had in his heart. He was walking it on his own. And there's always moments of walking things out, drawn out moments on your own, moments of silence, moments of just inspecting, moments of, of clarity, gathering the right information. I, I've been through those seasons. I've been through the season at Garden City Church where I've just needed to closely, quietly meditate, navigate, hear the voice of God, observe. I've been through that season in, in prior churches as well. You just need to sit back and observe, but not just in church. I've been in those seasons in relationships. I've been in those seasons in other employment. I've been in those seasons as I'm preparing for the next move where you go and you inspect. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Don't wait for somebody to come along that has your dream before you get the courage to step out. You will not find somebody that has your same God-given dream because God gave you the dream. God gave you the vision. So sometimes the dream can be a little lonely. Sometimes as the 
the details are being clarified, you might have moments of silence, but take heart. God is with you. And it's around this time that these characters, Sambalit, Tobias, and Gershom are introduced. Who are these clowns? <laughs> they're enemies of the Jews. Uh, and they're highlighted in this text. Uh, they, they, they served as regional governors. They served under the king of Persia. Uh, and they were of the people groups who were originally driven from the promised land uh, from, by the Israelites um, originally. Generations after they had uh, 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 possessed the promised land, some of these old enemies started creeping back in started finding their way back into Jerusalem to begin to oppress and taunt and, and get back where, where they were once driven from. And this is what we know from Scripture, is that the enemy will always try to resurface. The enemy will always try to work himself back in. Are you dealing with something that you once overcame, but now you feel like you're dealing with that again? Husbands, wives, you felt like you dealt with a season of conflict. You thought you overcame that. Now you're fighting again. You've got com conflict again. You've got division again. And now you think, oh my goodness, we didn't make any improvement. I want to tell you, you did make some improvement. I want to tell you that yesterday's battle is over. You might be facing a battle today, but battle from battle might look alike. There's war. There's fighting. There could be casualties. But just because you're in a new battle does not mean you did not have victory over yesterday's battle. Keep fighting. Keep standing. The enemy's always looking to resurface. Here, here's a startling scripture we get in Matthew 12, 43, uh, verses 43 and 44. Matthew 12, verses 43 and 44. It says, Now when the unclean spirit comes out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and it doesn't find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Now, at first, in hearing this passage, you might think, well, what do you mean? The house looks like it's nice and clean and everything is in place. But God has designed your life to be occupied. The, 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 the problem with this passage is that the vessel remains unoccupied. And when God delivers you out of something, and when God brings you through something, then it ought to be occupied with his presence and with his glory. And you see, this is what happened in Jerusalem. The walls were torn down, and people were just there, but they were purposeless. They were visionless. They didn't have anything going on. And I find it absolutely amazing that Nehemiah is led directly into a place that is governed by those who wish to oppress possess and enslave you got to understand that those places which god may lead you from time to time the whole reason why he might have put vision in your heart if you're led by mercy he may lead you into a work in order to bring about a great deliverance that's what's needed in our nation today so what we find is that the enemy's mission is to vex and hinder nehemiah from accomplishing his mission that's how the enemy works he wants to vex you he wants to oppress you he wants to hinder you he wants to taunt you and mock you. How, how did they? How did how did uh, Tobias and Sanballat and Gershom uh, try to make this happen? Well, they tried to incite rebellion. They tried to rally people to come against Nehemiah. They tried to entrap him. They mocked him, jeered him, lied. They made up accusations and even conspired to kill him. Now the question is why? Why did they do this? Well, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. It says that in verse 19. It says, they, along with Gershom, the Arab, mocked Nehemiah, saying, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And, and when the construction was taking place, they, their anger grew. It tells us Nehemiah 4.1, Sambalit heard that they were rebuilding the wall and he became angry. They were incest. They ridiculed the Jews. As you continue to read, uh, the opposition that Nehemiah faces is deadly. His story is that of building with a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other. Don't be surprised at God's call. He may, you may have the call and the favor and the mission, everything that was there in Nehemiah's life. The way he overcame the opposition was he kept his eye on the task. He kept his eye on the task. You know, the, the climax of Nehemiah's story is found in Nehemiah 6.3, that the enemy is plotting to kill him, trying to lure him away. And Nehemiah, with his eyes fixed on the vision, he sends back the response as they're calling to him, Nehemiah, come down here. We've got to show you something. Nehemiah, come down. He says, why should I come down? 
I am doing a great work. God has called you to a great work. God has called you to a great work. God has called you to something. I want to encourage you. Stay steadfast and stay faithful. If the enemy's coming after you, stay focused on the mission. If the enemy's trying to oppress, listen, the enemy wasn't riled up until Nehemiah showed up with a vision. Vision stirs up the enemy. Keep going. Vision also is a highway to victory. So let's focus on Nehemiah 2.20. It says, so I answered them and said, the God of heaven will make us successful. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no part. You have no right or memorial in Jerusalem. So through everything I've shared so far far in Nehemiah, I want to focus on this portion of scripture. Number one, the first thing you need to understand is that success is from God. Success is from God. Nehemiah was confident in the mission. He was confident he'd be successful and he'd accomplish it because his faith was in God, not in himself, not in his tools, not in his equipment. His faith was in God. He trusted, he believed, and he moved as God led him. So let me ask you this morning or this afternoon or whenever you're watching this, do you trust God? Do you believe God? The call and vision came as a response to the need. The call and the vision came as a response to the need that presented itself to Nehemiah. And I wonder if we're waiting on something that interests us to stoke the fire of vision. God might be saying, look around you. Look at the torn down gates that are all around you. Look at what's happening right now. I think there's enough going on in our world that ought to be a call. Oh, it ought to be a clarion call to action and it ought to ignite and stir and instigate a fire. What are you waiting on to catch vision today? The second thing, arise and build. Arise and build. Nehemiah says in verse uh, 20, in, in, in verse 20, his servants will arise and build. So two things are clear. God's people are defined by God's work. God's people are defined by God's work. You'll find this later on in the New Testament. What good is it to have faith without any actions? God's called you and saved you, not by the works that you've done. You can't win God's favor. You can't win salvation. You can't buy salvation. But once you are saved, God wants to release you into a great work. This is one of the definitive factors. The second thing is God always provides the resources. Nehemiah says his servants will arise and build. I tell you this morning, I declare to you by the Holy Spirit, arise and build. Arise and build. God's called you to rise up and build. The third thing is that the enemy is displaced. The work God wishes to do will leave the enemy with no place, no part, no right, and no memorial. That's what he says in in, in verse 20 here. Uh, let Let me read it one more time. Later in that verse, he says, his servants will arise and build, but you have no part, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. God wants you to build something that's going to drive the enemy out. God wants the work of your hands to drive the enemy out of the lives, out of the city. Drive it out of your home in Jesus' name. Drive it out of your marriage. Drive it out of your conversation. Drive the enemy out. Who's the enemy? In this story, it's the foreign nations seeking to, to, to infiltrate and humiliate God's people and where God's people live. In the New Testament, however, the enemy is far more of a spiritual matter. Ephesians 6.12 tells us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. John 10.10, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. What we can conclude from Nehemiah very briefly just today is that it's it's that in the midst of conflict, we discover the power of vision. What does vision do? Number one, vision will always offset your opposition. Your vision must be bigger than your opposition. Otherwise, you'll stop. Uh, vision will keep you going when the world throws everything at you, when it's a God-sized vision. But you got to remember also, God-sized vision means it's something you can't attain on your own. God has to have it. God has to make it happen. God will grant you strength. God will grant you the resources. God will grant you the favor. The vision from God will get you there even when you feel like quitting, even when you feel like giving up. Have you felt like quitting and giving up? You need to get a hold of the vision from God. 
Vision costs. Many have risked so much to accomplish great visions. I think of Nikola Tesla, think of Einstein, think of, of some of the great inventors, those in history that have had great vision. How much more is it worth sacrificing for a great God-ordained vision? Let me ask you this, just as Nehemiah had to battle for his vision, are you prepared to battle for God's vision? Are you prepared to war like Nehemiah with a sword and a hammer? What's it going to take for you to move? What's it going to take for you to, 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 to take hold of God's vision for your life? Maybe we need a voice that plants the seed in our hearts like the messengers who originally came to Nehemiah. That's, how, that's really where it began. I want to be that voice this morning. I want to be a voice that helps uh, realize your eyes being open. That'll push you to a place of fasting and weeping for the condition of the people. Oh, the condition of the people. Then you would be moved to action. Are you moved this morning? Do you look around the world and see the turmoil and see the anxiety, see the fear and see the depression? What does it do to you? If you're like me, often I feel like I'm boarding up my house. I'm, I'm boarding up my mind and my heart to keep it on the outside. But maybe those walls need to come down today. Before we can rebuild the walls, we need to recognize that maybe some of the walls need to come down so we can see the hurt so we can see the pain. I pray God will impart a vision for you today, the kind of vision that will make that kingdom come and make his will be done. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, for all who are under the sound of my voice today, God, I pray by the power of your spirit that you would sovereignly move over their hearts and begin to ignite a vision. Bring vision to life, God. Bring vision to life in me, a heavenly vision, a God-sized vision, not my vision, not my will, not what I want to see done, but God, what you want to see done. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Lord, that means my kingdom go. That means let thy kingdom come now. Let what you want to happen may it happen. Grant us vision this morning. Oh God, the kind of vision that offsets the opposition. God, I pray grant us a vision from heaven that ignites us and stirs us and fires us up so we would begin to work and labor. Teach us and show us what to do. But first, I believe you've got to draw us in a place of prayer, God. Move my heart towards deep prayer. Move my heart, oh God, to be moved into the deep intercessions. We would know you want you. God, draw us into you. I know you're doing a great work. I know it's a great call. And Father, I pray that you'll continue to stir our hearts for your glory and honor in the mighty matchless name of Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Listen, if you have more curiosity or interest about a great vision from heaven and what you want God to do in your life and how you want him to stir you, maybe it begins by just coming to know Christ, coming into an intimate relationship with the one who gives the vision. You can have that today. You can have that today by simply asking Christ into your life. But you know, salvation is really found in repenting, changing your mind, changing your heart, changing your thinking, saying, God, change me. I turn away from, from, uh, from a life of unbelief and I turn towards belief. I, I haven't believed, I haven't put my faith in you and now I'm gonna do that. That's part of repentance, is putting your faith in Christ where you once were putting your faith in yourself or in something else. You're putting it fully in Christ that you could now have a relationship with the vision giver of the universe. He loves you and he longs for you to reach out to him. Listen, if you want some extra prayer, I invite you to reach out to me. You can always email me at pastor at gardencitychurch.net. Until next time, God bless you. Have an excellent week.